Welcome to I Hate It Here, the podcast for HR and people professionals, making the hardest job in the world just a little bit easier. I'm Hibi Youssef. The data sets are so critical to how we're making decisions. If you have a data set that is built for men by men, and you have no women on your team to be like, hey, this data set actually doesn't represent me. We're not going to build equitable AI systems, and instead we're just going to be continuously perpetuating the biases that are already existing in that group of people, and they may not know it. They may be like, I support women, I'm a feminist, that's great, but like at the end of the day, you have unconscious bias because you haven't lived those experiences. Welcome back to another episode of the I Hate It Here pod. I am pumped for today's episode because I have a badass founder and CEO who's actively working to solve a real, a very real problem we're facing at work and one that is near and dear to my heart. For as long as I can remember, my sister has been my biggest idol. She's wicked smart, holding a PhD in electrical engineering. She's ambitious and she's really freaking funny. Growing up, I would hear stories about how she was often the only in the room and it would make me really, really mad. And when I entered the workforce, I worked at a few different tech companies, and every time I observed, there was rarely gender diversity on the teams, on the tech teams. In fact, many teams struggled to recruit women. And I saw firsthand what my sister had experienced in her career, and it was pretty heartbreaking. So I'm pumped for today's guest, and no, it's not my sister, despite her asking to come on this pod many, many, many times. Maybe that's a future episode, but today's guest is someone who's actively working on improving the gender diversity problem we often see in tech. Marissa McNeelans is the founder and CEO of Toast, a membership-based collective dedicated to connecting and supporting women in tech. Toast partners with companies that prioritize gender diversity, assisting them in recruiting talented women for their tech teams, and also offers members career coaching, negotiation support, and workshops. Marissa's mission through Toast is to create a more diverse and equitable tech industry, empowering women to thrive. And prior to Toast, Marissa worked in product management at Scotiabank, ATB Financial, and PwC Canada, where she saw firsthand the lack of gender diversity in tech and product. Marissa, welcome to the I Hated Here pod. Hi, I'm so excited to be here. Thanks so much for having me on. What a introduction. I'm so excited to dig into Toast and all the things that you have done. I was just so inspired when I first met you. Honestly, I met you and I was like, shit, she's so cool. I have to have her on the podcast. (laughs) Likewise, the same. I was like, I need to be on this podcast. I will say I I feel like I am never looking forward to podcasts whenever I do them. I'm, you know, being on the other side of this. I'm always like, oh, I have to go do a podcast. But I was like up bright and early this morning. I was like, yes, I'm so excited for this conversation. I love that. I'm so honored because you also have your own podcast. So, you know, you're used to this. I haven't worked on my podcast in probably like three years at this point. Um, I know it's it's one of those difficult things. I know how much work goes into like behind the scenes to make a podcast happen. And it's just one of those things that I couldn't keep up with. So props to you. Well, you're focusing on more important things, which we're going to get to. But before we do, every season, I usually like pick a focus. It aligns with like what I'm writing about in the newsletter and what I want to talk about on the podcast. And this season is all about strong relationships. So I've been asking every guest just as an opening question, what do you believe is the key to maintaining strong relationships at work? I think there's a lot of things, but ultimately, I think what's allowed me to succeed and almost build a competitive advantage for myself in my career has been vulnerability, maybe not so much vulnerability, but authenticity and, you know, having the courage because it really is courageous to show up in systems that aren't made for you and to show up and be your completely authentic self. And I think there's so much power in sharing your own story and your own struggles and having someone else look at you and say, hey, me too. Hey, I'm experiencing that. And as you mentioned, with the story about your sister, women on technical teams are so often the only. And being that person to come in and role model, like opening up about your struggles and talking about things that are real outside of work and that impact you at work, it just allows other people to relate to it, to feel a sense of psychological safety uh, in the workplace. And I think that's what actually like creates solid bonds. 
vulnerability and authenticity, I think, are often very hard. And in the last like few years, we've seen people really try to embrace it. Whereas like I feel like my early leaders in my career were like, no feelings, be professional, don't act like yourself. And now I feel like leaders are like, hey, like try to bring your whole self to work as much as possible. We'll allow for it. So I also love that. I just there's something powerful about being yourself and being accepted. It's like the the like millennial leader TikToks <laughs> that you watch. I feel like I feel like I relate to so many of those. Just Same. you know, I'm like, oh, that is that is oh. literally me. Um, but I think that is the difference. And honestly, even like reporting into, you know, I, I think like the higher up you go, you're still getting some of those like old school mindsets. And sometimes it just takes like one person to kind of break the mold and even though I have been in a position where I've been like, you know, my leaders are like, oh, no, emotions or like, oh, don't talk about your mental health. Like, I don't know what to do with that. Um, Still like having the courage to be like, actually, I'm still going to talk openly about this with the team, even though it's like not accepted for me. We always need kind of those people and those leaders to really break the mold. And it's great to see the millennial leader being able to do that. I love it. I'm like, more millennials in leadership positions. We're going to end up with a better work-life balance. Let's get it <laughs> right. in there. Um, yeah. on, on the note of stories, we, you touched a little bit on it, like being being able to bring your authentic self to work and be able to tell your story. Like, Can you share the story behind the founding of Toast and what inspired you to create the company? Yeah. I mean, our origin story goes back to kind of the beginning of my career. I started my career in talent acquisition. I just kind of fell into high volume recruitment in skilled trades. It was like not sexy at all whatsoever. I was literally in like the oil rigs of Alberta, like recruiting millwrights. Um, Literally, in the, I remember when I was offered that job, I was like 20 years old or something. And they were like, you should get a fake engagement ring. <laughs> yeah yeah so that like people that <laughs> right so that people think that you're you're married and so I kind of went through that but I was like I just really enjoyed like being able to work with people you know everyone was super excited about finding a job or you know getting to work and it makes such an impact on people's lives and so I think that string of impact really started early for me But when I moved into financial services, um, the company I was working at started building software in-house and someone kind of picked me up and sponsored me and was like, I think you would make a great product manager. And this was like 2015. And I was like, what is a product manager? Like literally (laughs) no idea. Googling it. (laughs) Yeah. And so I stood up like one of the first agile development teams at the company Casual. It was cool because it was it was like very new for everyone. And so they brought in these like incredible powerhouses in agile and in software development. Melissa Perry is one of them that I got to be trained under. Um, but it was a lot of like fake it till you make it. But really, at that time, there was a lot more diversity because they were transitioning people out of like current roles into like, hey, we're going to start building software into these like new product manager roles. And so I got to do some like really cool stuff and had a lot of autonomy and was just kind of learning as I went. But as the company grew and matured, layoffs happened, a lot more experienced people were brought in. And all of a sudden, there was no women around me. And all of a sudden, it was kind of like that support system was gone. And as I moved up, And further throughout my career, I got into data and AI products. I ended up doing a master's in artificial intelligence and really kind of honed in on the AI field. Um, I just felt like there were fewer and fewer uh, women in rooms, fewer and fewer women making decisions. Ultimately, I was on a team where I was leading conversational AI products and like the greater team had 50 people and I was the one woman. Um, And there's so many things that come with that with like you know, having your judgment questioned, you know, women in in technical fields are twice as likely to experience microaggressions than women in non-technical fields. And so I was like, one, we need another woman on this team, at least just one. (laughs) So so my vulnerable conversations don't fall on deaf ears. Um, And so I went to like recruit another woman on the team and I was only given resumes of men. 
uh, and really when I looked at it, I was like, well, we're building, we're a financial services company, we're building models uh, that are making, not so making decisions, but like serving 100% of the population. Why do our teams only represent 50%? Um, and kind of being constantly told that no women are applying and not seeing it as a business issue just kind of forced me to go, I need a solution for this. And that's kind of how Toast was born. One woman on a team of 50 people, would, that would drive me nuts. Yeah, it did. <laughs> <laughs> it's like so it's such a fascinating thing, like especially with AI, too. And you and I talked about this in our first call, Invisible Women, the book all about how there's like a lack of data about women and how we experience the world. And then you think about these AI tools that are being built by potentially predominantly male teams who aren't also thinking like, what are women in this world experiencing? What are underrepresented groups of people experiencing? It's so different. So I'm fascinated that you went through that experience and you had to navigate that. And I can only imagine it might have been really hard at times to be the only. Like my sister has shared that so often that it really sucks. You feel yeah. very alienated. You feel very alone. And and she has shared so many times like people question her judgment. And she's like, I have a PhD. Like, I'm not, not going <laughs> right. to be a jerk about it, but like, Come on. So I think that is that's very interesting. I can't wait to dig in more into like the challenges women face in tech. But you started your career in product management and now you're the CEO and the founder of a company. How have you carried kind of that background in product management into what you're actually building at Toast? In so many ways, we run the company as a product, it's interesting, we are very much a service-based business, but we operate with a product mindset in every way. And if you look at kind of the hiring landscape, especially the third-party recruiter kind of agency model, it is very dated and doesn't have a lot of innovation in it. And so really, we've come in and looked at like, how do we, how do we change this? I know that there's not a silver bullet. I think you look at so many companies who have tried to like implement AI uh, into the hiring process and it it definitely is not a silver bullet. Um, But instead we look at like, how can we make incremental changes? How can we ensure that we have a strategy that is actually working for both of our user groups. Um, I think what you see in a lot of recruitment is that they're just focused on the client because the client is paying, but like ultimately we need to look at the end-to-end user experience. And that is for us, that's women who are either like just getting into tech, have worked in tech for years, um, but ultimately, how do we give them the confidence and the skills that they need to get to a point where they're, you know, even going to be applying for jobs or ready to go into a room where they are one of 50 and like make a splash and make a difference all the way through to like helping our companies and our clients that we work with and helping them to hire the best women. And so we really look at it as a journey and really look at how we can like productize these pieces and and take them to market and commercialize these. I love that it's the full product life cycle. Like you're not just trying to go to the tech companies and influence them. You're also trying to empower the women and help them get the skills and stuff they need to be able to get those jobs. So that's it's a beautiful approach. As you said, it's hard to be the lonely in that room, right? And it It's not like every single person is going to be okay with just being like dropped into, you know, a room of of 50 men who are working in in the like cross section of finance and tech. It definitely takes a person. It takes the confidence. It takes a lot of a lot of courage, I think, to to be in that position and to like hold your own. And then also you're like we're putting a lot of burden on women as well to be like, you also need to like pull the other women up. You need to be the one who's going to be like, hey, we don't have any other women here. We need to go hire more. And like, that's a big burden as well when like, you know, 49 against one and you're the only person raising this. There's so many challenges women face when they're in tech and that is one of them, the burden. What what are some other ones that you've seen? The biggest, most shocking stat to me was that 50% 
of women in tech leave the workforce or they, they leave the tech industry, the tech workforce after about 10 years. And so that's just like, how long can you actually put up with, you know, having to work harder to be offered the same opportunities? I know I shared with you that report that came out of um, Toronto a couple months ago that the tech industry in Canada, the gender pay gap has actually tripled from 2016 That's to 2022. I know that that's crazy. Like women were making $75,000 less than men on average. They are now making $22,000 less than men. And the more educated women are, the less money they are making when compared to their educated male colleagues, which is crazy. It just shows that our systems are so, so broken. And so really like staying in an industry like that for 10 years and like not progressing and experiencing the microaggressions day to day, it makes sense that women are going to leave. But ultimately, we're still not seeing men being held accountable or taking the same responsibility for increasing the the gender equity within this industry. And unfortunately, it's still falling on women. And in order to advance, we need more women in influential roles. We need more women in leadership. And we can't have women leaving the workforce after only 10 years. Yeah, I think the latest report I read, too, was that women have not yet returned to the workforce, uh, the level we were at the Mm pre-pandemic. So if you're just thinking about like the workforce in general, We have not yet returned to like women in the workplace pre-pandemic. And I can only imagine in tech, it's just as worse. They're leaving in 10 years and maybe a lot of them left during the pandemic and aren't going to return. And now we have this like very small percentage of people who are actively working in tech. I mean, it's it's a very like male dominated space. And there are a lot of people that are trying to change that. But I think tech has just become like for the guys. Mm-hmm. And that's just so weird. That's so weird to me because yeah. I'm like, women have buying power. We also interact with technology. We also are building and we're doing influential things. And so I think about that quite a bit too. And then I, the last piece on like challenges, I think women in tech face today is that like less, I was reading the report that like less than 5% of VC funding globally yeah. goes to women in underrepresented groups. Mm-hmm. So even when you have women who want to go the founder route, when they want to go build the thing, they're not getting as much funding as their male counterparts. A lot of it comes back to like this perception of who is in tech. And I actually went, I, I like always recall this conversation. I went to this event that was like this very like bougie event. And I like went by myself and I was like talking to people. I'm like, yeah, I work in AI. And I remember one lady like literally looked me up and down and was like, you don't look like you work in AI. And I was like, that's just like, that's <laughs> that's very interesting. Because like in my what? career, I've experienced that where And even like the higher up I went, the more educated I got and I'm a master's in AI and I'm like running an an AI generated business and not an AI generated. I'm running an AI enabled business. Um, (laughs) I'm running an AI enabled business, but ultimately people see me as like a people leader or like a soft skill person and so I've always been like given those opportunities like oh you you can communicate and you can lead so like therefore you must not be technical I'm like well no I've worked really hard you know to get here Mm -hmm. so I think there's a lot of perception that goes into that but also like if we look back in history women were the first software developers we were the first like computers like literally the idea of a computer started at nasa because it was women who were manually doing all of the like calculations and the computations for getting spaceships into space And that word computers, they were then referred to as computers. So really like the basis of the tech industry is built on the backs of women. But then once you see high salaries and high growth in this industry, all of a sudden that narrative shifts, right? And it's like, well, this is a man's thing because that's what men want, (laughs) the wealth, you know, that growth and Like, ultimately, if we're going to close the gender pay gap, we need more women in tech because we need them in high growth industry 
with high salaries, but it's it's getting around that like perception piece. There's a really good book called The Art of Perception that was written by Amy Herman. I think I got to meet her at a conference and it really made me like rethink a lot of the things that I just naturally think. And she takes art and has you like interpret art and what you see and like helps you understand Ooh. your perception of certain situations. I think it's super powerful. It's a great book to read. It's somewhere on my bookshelf. But that perception is so real and so pervasive, honestly. Like I have worked with yeah. CTOs that are like, I don't really want to hire women. Oh, she's going to take maternity leave. I don't want to have to deal with that. And I'm just like, what is wrong with you? Like, Yeah, right? Or there's the ones who don't say that at all, who are like, I support women. I am not biased. I have no unconscious bias. And you're like, you don't understand the idea of unconscious bias. <laughs> You, know? you have it. We all have yeah, it. Exactly. I think it's like that the shift to of getting people to understand the importance of gender diversity in tech. Like how do you think about and talk about the importance of having gender diversity in tech and how it actually creates like a more innovative culture? There's so many studies out there that talk about having gender diverse teams and what they do for the bottom line, women founded companies, companies that have at least one co-founder that is a woman, right? And like that they outperform. There's just like the studies are all there, but like ultimately, and I think where kind of I found my passion and actually like one of the reasons where I was like, I'm going to go do a master's in AI and I'm like, I'm going to get technical other than being told you know, my whole career that I was not technical enough. The master's didn't help in that <laughs> I was still not technical You don't say. Enough. You don't yeah. say. <laughs> right? But one of the reasons was because looking into AI and like how the data sets are so critical to how we're making decisions. If you have a data set that is built for men by men and you have no women on your team to be like hey this data set actually doesn't represent me we're not going to build equitable ai systems and instead we're just going to be continuously perpetuating the biases that are already existing in that group of people and they may not know it they may be like I support women. I'm a feminist. That's great. But like at the end of the day, you have unconscious bias because you haven't lived those experiences the same way I can't, you know, look at a data set and be like, oh, this I'm not a black woman. I am a white woman. This doesn't represent me either. We need diversity of thought, of experience, of culture, of backgrounds and of gender in order to ensure that these data sets represent the people in which they will serve. It's wild because people, when companies, you just, you miss out on solving so many unique problems if your tech team is not diverse. Like at, exactly. at the end of the day, I'm like, and and I feel like we've been seeing the heat online about DEI, sure, I'm removing the E and equitable and it, and there's a day in my life where I will not have to say like the business reason behind why you should have a diverse team. But the other part is if you are building tech and you want to build the best tech in the world, you want that tech to be used by the world and the world is the most diverse it's ever been. Gen Z is the most diverse generation we've ever had. So why would you not want your team to reflect the world outside? You want your team to build the solutions that your your tech is actually solving. You want that to reflect the people who are going to be using and working with it. So I think like that is when I think about gender diversity in tech, that's like one of my biggest things. Like you want to build a product that's going to serve everyone. But how can you do that if your team only experiences one singular experience in this world? Exactly. There's a lot of cool things about that. But then, so you work, you have two sides. You work with the company, companies with Toast, and you work with the individuals who are trying to break into tech. How do you actually approach partnerships with companies to ensure they're really committed to this? Because I think, as we've seen in the last four years, a lot of companies have been like, we, we believe in DEI, we want diverse teams. And then they look at the dollars spent and they actually realize we've made no impacts. How do you suss it out? This has changed for us quite a bit since our inception. When we first started, we had like a very, you know, mathematical equation where we were like, here's how we're going to vet everyone. And we're going to look at their board representation, their C-suite representation, the teams, 
But what we saw is that you can have a board that is 50% women. You can have a C-suite that's 50% women. You can have a whole team that's 50% women and still not be a great place to work for women and not be a safe space, right? And so ultimately, we honestly do very, very little outreach. We are not going to go and talk to companies and convince them that they need women. We saw that the number one indicator of success with a client is them understanding that they have a problem and wanting to fix it. And so it's a lot about like flexibility. And so if you come to us and you're like, we need to hire more women because our VCs are telling us we need to be more diverse. That's not going to get us anywhere. Like ultimately, if companies come to us and they're like, hey, we're really not getting women applying to these roles and we want to be intentional and we know that we need more women on our team. How can we change our recruitment process to be able to attract and hire and retain more women? And it's that flexibility because you're not going to get different results if you continuously do the same thing. And that is true for hiring. You can't just put a job description out and expect everyone to apply and just like magically there's going to be more women. Like we need to think about like what your processes look like, what your interview process is, where are you excluding people, but also we have a much smaller talent pool to choose from, which is just the case because women are leaving, because women aren't going into STEM fields at as high as they used to um, go into for education. And so ultimately, like we need to have companies that are flexible and want to do this versus being mm-hmm. forced. Like you're not going to have good results when someone says they're forced to do something, right? That like no. that's incentive misalignment is like forcing someone to do it. And then you really want them to come to you and care about it. Um, yeah. you, you've worked with these companies. Have you seen some common mistakes they've made when they're trying to recruit and retain women in tech roles? Yeah. I think ultimately like doing the, the same thing. Right. And it's interesting because I think a, a like, a pretty difficult conversation is often around technical skills assessments mm-hmm. because they they are often I have like, thoughts <laughs> right they are often timed observed coding assessments and what we see we actually had a client very recently come to us and said zero uh, percent of women have passed our technical assessment what are we doing wrong? And we're like, yes, this these are the clients that we want to be working with. Wow. This is why you're here. But it's really looking at, in that case, for an example, we started asking questions like, well, who's in the room? And it's usually virtual. Like, who is it who's watching them? And their team is all men because no women have passed the exam. And they get on a call and like some of them have their cameras on or they won't have their cameras on and they make no small talk. And it's just like sitting there in silence watching one of our candidates code and she's nervous and she has no su- support and like, you know, wasn't disarmed at the beginning. And it's just like this super stressful experience and so sometimes it's like little things like hey well can you have like you know your hr person who's a woman get on the call make small talk have your development team hey how's your day how's your morning surprised yeah (laughs) you know what's new with you it was it it was like we're not telling you to lower your threshold on technical assessments, but like you need to set up an environment that will enable everyone to thrive and to feel safe. And so we've implemented some like paired programming assessments where, you know, someone on the team does one line and then our candidate does another line. And it's just so much more collaborative. Also, when we look at like Okay, in the workforce, if there's a bug, do you expect that bug to be fixed by one person in isolation on their own and have it done within an hour? Or is it more collaborative where they like have peers, people that they can reach out to, um, can ask questions if they're stuck? And like, if so, then the interview process needs to echo that. I'm not a fan of live coding exercises, honestly. I think it makes – I'm somebody who thrives on the spot. Like you could literally throw me on a Mm -hmm. stage, 
and give me wild questions. I'm like, I bam, 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 bam. I thrive. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Um, I'm not the norm. I think a lot no. of people feel, and, and so honestly, if like somebody was watching me put together like a people ops program, I probably would also just be like, Ugh. you're like spelling every word wrong. Yeah, like my, whatever, I'm like sharing my screen <laughs> trying to type every like second word is spelled wrong. I'm like, I don't know basic English anymore. I, I <laughs> grew up in the time of like autocorrect. Okay. So I can't spell for shit. Um, but right. no, it's like, it's very true. So like, I've never been a fan of live coding. So I'm just like, people that's not comforting for people. And I don't know no. what you gain after watching them code because basically like you're going to watch them. They're going to make a mistake that's like normal. But usually if someone's not watching them, they'll correct the mistake or they'll rethink what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Suddenly you have someone watching you and you, you're like, oh my God, I can't get this wrong. And I, I kept saying like I worked somewhere where they really wanted to do it. I was like, this is not safe. It's not safe for like people from underrepresented groups. It's not safe for women. Like, it's just not a good thing. So then we moved to give people the option. You could do like this async project or you could do a live coding exercise. Like, I also think that flexibility too, giving the option of we can watch you and code with you or you can do it on your own and submit it, I think is yeah. also really powerful too. That for would be sure. a good one. I think there's so many conversations around like, well, what if they use AI? What if they're using ChatGPT or Copilot? And we're like, yeah, but... Don't you want your developers to use that if in they the would use in real life, like in yeah, their job? Could. Yeah, right? yeah. Everyone's using it in real life. Exactly. Wild. I want to. I want to wrap up the episode with like two two things: trends and advice. I feel like you have seen so much from the tech side, AI. What do you see any trends emerging at the intersection of AI, HR, and diversity over the next few years? What we've seen over the last year or so is just this absolute crazed hype on AI <laughs> as if it's a silver bullet. It's not. It is not. It's been painful <laughs> to watch the hype, but I do think it is going to impact our workforce a lot. I think what we're seeing, what's predicted is that 10% of 80% of the jobs are going to be replaced or augmented by AI. And I think we're already kind of seeing that, you know, those those tasks that were repetitive that probably no one wanted to do, no one wanted to um, waste their time on that anyway, are being kind of replaced by AI. And we see an impact of that a bit on like efficiencies within the workforce. But I do think that uh, like HR professionals are going to really need to like have a strategy and look at the roles in the organization and think long term in terms of like who needs to be upskilled. How do we ensure that we're bringing everyone with us instead of just like cutting <laughs> and going forward? But if we can bring people with us, then we are going to see more diverse workforces, right? I go back to like my story and my situation where I was like sitting in talent acquisition and I had someone who was like, hey, come stand up this this software development team. And like because of that, I am where I am today and like was able to build out a business that like makes the impact that we do at Toast. But ultimately, I think that's going to be the biggest trend is like we need to lean on HR professionals to look at how we're bringing people with us in the AI revolution. If you're listening to this and you haven't yet thought about how AI is going to impact everything at your organization, I would just say start now. Like you don't want to get to three years from now and realize that you you were not ready for what the impact is going to be. And I do think it's going to start with like looking at the skills you have, figuring out what can be augmented with AI and what you actually need a person to do. And there's a lot for a person to do, to be clear. Like I'm not afraid of AI doing my admin work. Honestly, I would rather it do my admin work. But I think a lot of people are kind of like, oh, my God, that's like a big part of my job. And I just want to say, like, if you're not doing that admin work, you have more time to do like really creative strategic work. Exactly. So let's like embrace that. Like, that's where I want to see more HR people go, because I just think we're, our time is wasted in the admin. And and that's just not a good use of our time. Mm -hmm. I'd rather do anything else. That's where AI thrives. That's where like. You know, we've been looking and there's been organizations that have been implementing machine learning in their operations for years and years and years. Yeah. And like, I don't think we're going to see AI taking over like, you know, this talk about like general intelligence. I'm like, that's 
that's not something that you're going to see. You know, it's not something to be scared of. It's something to embrace for like, what are those things that are repeatable? My headphone literally just <laughs> fell out of my ear. <laughs> happens to me all the time. I don't think they're made to oh, like fit my ear there, lobes, no. honestly. Um, I, I know. That. I agree. Probably a man. <laughs> a man definitely made the air AirPods. Yeah, I know. <laughs> They always fall out on airplanes if I'm ever on like a long, if I'm yep. like sleeping or something and then it falls out and it's like under the seat and you have to like wake up the person behind you. <laughs> never fun. It's never fun. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you have given me so much time and so many good nuggets today, but I always love to end every episode of the podcast with some advice. So what advice would you give to women in tech who are struggling to find inclusive workplaces? Go find your community first. Go find, you know, those other people who are in the same situation as I talked about in the beginning, the power of me too. Something that was so impactful for me was actually like finding a community of women um, long before I founded Toast. It's actually how I met my now um, co-founder was through a community um, for women in business um, in Calgary and it was the first time in my life that I had been surrounded by women who like talked openly about salary, who like still had were experiencing the same things that I was at work where but I like felt so alone. I was like, this is only me and this is a me issue. And then like just hearing other people, I was like, oh, this isn't a me issue. This is a systemic issue. And like this needs to be resolved. But having that community and hearing from other people. And I think that's how you really can like get the true pulse on if an organization is actually inclusive or is everything that their DEI marketing makes makes them out to be. And also just asking, leaning on those people, asking them to open doors. That's, I think, the biggest superpower is having a community of people behind you who are there to like cheer you on and open up doors for you. I always talk about the power of community. I have my own HR community. I needed it because I was like, I need to talk to somebody because I'm dealing with some nonsense today and nobody understands the nonsense I'm dealing with like other HR people. So I love that. For people who are looking to get in touch with you or learn more about Toast, where should they go? Yeah, try toast.community. Um, we have all of our information on there. You can look me up on LinkedIn, Marissa McNeilans. Uh, I'm pretty active on there, but um, definitely give us a follow on all socials. Love it. Thank you so much for spending time with me today. I'm so inspired by what you're building. I just, I want there to be more women in leadership positions and I want there to be more women in technical leadership positions. So my sister and anybody else never has to feel like the only in a room. It's never yeah. fun to be that only person, to be the only person with a lived experience. It's incredibly lonely. And mm-hmm. so I'm hoping that we can solve this problem in the future and really get to a place where we have good gender diversity in all industries and all levels of every company. For sure. We will. We we'll will. Get there. We will do it. They better yeah. listen to us. Thank you so much for being here today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's been so fun. Thanks for tuning in. Keep up with all the latest HR resources by subscribing on Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you listen. And if you love I Hate It here, tell an HR friend. I'll see you next time. <laughs>